Can you hear me okay back in the hinterlands back there? My name is Kevin Kervick, and I'm the organizer of Seacoast Common Sense Community Builders. And we're a new meetup group in the Seacoast area. And our essential mission is to sow seeds, uh, to share ideas and energies in order to build a healthier community. We see our role as sowing seeds and being good neighbors in order to contribute to a better community and a better world. But more specifically, we're really trying to advance common sense ideas and solutions that are informed by classical liberty. Uh, this Common Sense Tuesday series is our first endeavor into the community. So thank you for coming. Uh, we thought we would try to get out there with a bang and have some topics that people might be interested in, as it might have been seeing who we are to the community. Um, the talks are scheduled to go until 8 p.m., although if last week is any indication of what happens, we continue for about another hour and a half downstairs. So uh, for as long as people want to communicate, I don't think they'll kick us out up here, and we usually want to run down to the bar as well. So, And we're always talking about issues online as well. Um, so we'll start in just a few minutes. We'll go for about an hour or so, and we're going to try to take questions along the way and have some time for questions at the end as well. Okay. Um, all the presentations are being filmed, and we're going to try to get them on the Internet. It really depends on how well the quality, how, how the quality is. Hopefully it'll come out okay and we'll get them on our website so you'll be able to go uh, to the presentations afterwards and, and watch them again and tell your friends. Um, we have five more events scheduled after this one that take us pretty much through the summer, although we kind of spread them out, spread them out in August a bit because people are on vacation. Um, but if it goes well and based on the turnout so far, uh, hopefully it'll continue to go well. And we'll probably continue them indefinitely. It may or may not be here, it may be somewhere else, it may be different topics, we may broaden or contract, but we will probably continue in some form uh, into the fall as well. If you want a listing of the events, I have them over there, and they're also on our website. Uh, just Google Seacoast Common Sense Community Builders and you'll find them. Next week's presentation. Uh, Jason Walls, who's here, is presenting on uh, avoiding crisis thinking, and it should be an interesting, interesting topic. Um, we're delighted that Blue Mermaid has agreed to host the presentation, so please patronize them, be good to your server. Uh, they're offering us a space for free, so it's very nice of them to do that, uh, and it's one of my favorite places in town, so uh, hopefully we'll be, uh, pick them up on their good food and their good spirits. Okay, let me introduce our speaker. Um, I met Michael Finger in Market Square one day, I think. Um, I think he was trying to escape from Manhattan with his wife, Vanessa. And we were talking about uh, what that would entail. My wife, Karen, and I uh, had escaped from the Philadelphia area uh, not too long before that. And we discovered this lovely utopia we call Portsmouth. So I think we chatted about that a little bit. Uh, but I can immediately see that Mike was a, a man of high intellect and considerable gravitas, especially for someone so young. Um, what impressed me the most was that he seemed to get the concept that free people tend to make the best neighbors. I know we'll talk about that tonight. But freedom and neighborliness tend to go hand in hand. Um, that, and that's, in a nutshell, is the rationale behind Seacoast Common Sense Community Builders. So freedom and, and, and neighborliness kind of go together. Um, okay. And since then, we've had several conversations about similar topics on several different occasions, and I tend to, to learn a lot from it when we speak. Mike graduated with honors from Tulane University with a BA in philosophy. We have a lot of philosophy people here for some reason. Um, he's a principal at Sentinel Co uh, Consulting, which is a marketing and economic consultancy based in Portsmouth. Um, he has worked in real estate development and on Wall Street, and through which he developed a keen understanding of economic forecasting, direct marketing, and public relations. Sentinel combines these disciplines to identify growing markets and help businesses effectively target them. He's a much sought after libertarian thinker uh, with maturity behind, beyond his years. Uh, Mike's credits include Al Jazeera English, the Portsmouth Herald, BlueRockwell.com, and the Tul Tulane Hullabaloo. The title of this evening's presentation is Austrian School Economics, Your Window to Understanding the Financial Crisis. Uh, as a little intro, very few Americans have heard of the Austrian School of Economics. In fact, even if you major in, in economics in college, Chances are you still were never exposed to these thinkers. Uh, Karl Menger, 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 Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, and Murray Rothbard. 
but their disciples were the only ones to adequately predict the current financial crisis. When mainstream economists were forecasting rising housing prices for the foreseeable future. Michael will explain how the Austrians were able to see that the dot-com and housing bubbles would collapse and why they see an even greater crisis ahead. Also, Michael will discuss strategies to protect yourself and your family during these difficult times. Welcome, Michael Finger. Thank you, Michael. Um, hi, uh, I'm Mike Finger. Uh, Kevin uh, covered some of the uh, intro, so you have an understanding of why we're here. Um, just uh, sort of a little ground rule here. So I guess feel free to interrupt me with questions. Uh, there's a lot of material to cover, so uh, if, if you just ask a question, try to give it some time, but if, just jump in. Uh, if I'm too loud, if I'm too quiet, anything, feel free to interrupt me throughout this presentation. Uh, hopefully uh, we, can, we can get through a lot of this and uh, have it be valuable for you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to start off, I'm going to give you kind of a crash course on economic theory, and that's going to help lay the groundwork for understanding what's happening with the current financial crisis and how it will how apply to you. Uh, so bear with me while we do some, some background. Uh, first, how many of you have heard of the Austrian school before today? Okay. So those of you who haven't, this is very strange. To be in a room where maybe 50 or more percent of people have heard of the Austrian school just reflects New Hampshire's independent streak and how sophisticated people are in the Seacoast region. But if you went to any random, as, as, as Kevin mentioned, if you went to a random economics class, most of the students will not have heard of the Austrian school, much less dealt with it at any level. Um, and it's a shame because uh, the Austrians were uh, the only economists to effectively predict the financial crisis, uh, and they were the only ones to, they, there, were, uh, there were a few that made fluke predictions, but the Austrians could actually explain why, as far back as uh, the late 90s, why uh, central bank policy and financial uh, fiscal policy was going to create, for the first to create a dot-com bubble and then a housing bubble, and why that was destined to collapse. So it's, it's important stuff to know. Um, Thomas Carlyle famously called economics the dismal science, and I think people still feel that way about it. Uh, and whether it's the fact that it's boring, maybe some people have taken economics, they took an economics 101 class in college, um, maybe it seemed confusing, uh, some people feel that it's corrupt, uh, and I think all of those things are true uh, of mainstream economics. Uh, as it's taught right now, uh, it's, it's boring, convoluted, and corrupt, and you're, you're not to be blamed for just deciding to put it aside and not concern yourself with it. And I'm glad that those of you who haven't heard of, of this have come out tonight to try to uh, hear a different approach. Um, because real economics is, uh, is very simple and extremely powerful and applicable to your everyday life. Um, and the only challenge with it is that uh, it's not always intuitive. So our instincts about how we deal with other people aren't always, uh, don't always match reality. We are, you know, basically overgrown apes. So what we think is happening when we trade, trade with people uh, isn't always what's happening. So people get caught uh, with e economic fallacies. So the purpose of economics is to identify what's really going on and help us avoid those kinds of fallacies. Um, and by learning this approach, you'll be able to see hidden costs, uh, opportunity costs. So an opportunity cost is when I decide to take the afternoon off and go play soccer instead of doing my work, then I, the opportunity cost is the lost revenue from those, those hours I wasn't billing, uh, but I got the enjoyment of the leisure. So we're constantly making these kinds of decisions. Uh, people don't always take those into account. They might spend an uh, inordinate amount of time looking for a parking space when they could be in their office you know, billing that time. Um, so first, let's do a little history of the Austrian school. You heard some of the names. Uh, the founding father is Karl Menger. Uh, he was uh, alive in the late 1800s to early 1900s uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and he started a school to refute what was the predominant school at that time, the German historical school. Um, and the German historical school was beginning to apply the methods of natural science to human interaction. And he laid the groundwork for saying why that is not possible and why it was destined to failure. 
the, in response, the, the German historical school uh, basically labeled them Austrians because in Germany, Austria was considered a backwater. So, you know, so it's like, you might as well call it the redneck school of economics. Um, so that's how they got their name. But all the principal thinkers did end, uh, come from Austria-Hungary. Um, and uh, Karl Menger was followed by uh, notable thinkers like Ludwig von Mises, uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, and Murray Rothbard. Um, all of them, except Rothbard, were originally from Austria-Hungary. Uh, so the name is accurate, uh, even though it confuses people today. And the interesting thing about Austria-Hungary at this time was that it was a large empire that covered a lot of different ethnicities. Uh, people were coexisting in a large market peacefully, even though they didn't necessarily have cultures in common. Uh, and what we know today, today Austria-Hungary is Yugos was Yugoslavia, and then it broke up, now it's Bosnia, and it's uh, Romania, and it's all these di different little ethnic-based countries. But at that time, all these people were coexisting, for the most part, and trading with each other. So it, it created something that looks a lot like early America, where you have all these people coming together, and it's sort of fertile ground for tolerance and liberalism. And what came out of that was the Austrian School, which is a radically laissez-faire, uh, tolerant, and liberal uh, approach to economics. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the Austrian school was imported to America when von Mises uh, fled uh, the Nazi takeover of Europe. So Ludwig von Mises lived from the early 1900s until um, I think that in the 70s. Um, and uh, he was Jewish, and he so he basically he fled to, from Austria-Hungary to Switzerland, eventually ended up in New York. Uh, once he got here, it, it was fertile ground for reasons I think we all understand. Uh, the, we are a very liberal culture. Todd touched on uh, last week the fact that we do have this seed of classical liberalism <coughs> with us. So the Austrian school was able to not exactly uh, take over, but it was able to survive. Whereas in many countries in the world, if you present ideas like this, you are either mar marginalized uh, to the point of destitution or you can even be killed. Um, <coughs> So the philosophy remains revolutionary to this day. Uh, it can be considered an entirely distinct approach from mainstream economics. Uh, and that, this would be the economics that you would hear anywhere, uh, aside from this room and maybe some, some small uh, circles of scholars. Uh, we had an attendee last week, who's still here, um, mentioned that, uh, that you went to uh, University of Chicago and they taught from Milton Friedman to through, through Keynes, uh, or, or Krugman would be a modern version. So that, to me, I hear that it's like it's like knowing about politics from Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama, which is a it is a spectrum, but it might leave out some important ideas uh, that would help you get to the root of some problems. I think a lot of people here understand that the Democrats and the Republicans will focus on these wedge issues and try to get people arguing about things that are less important while every, everyone in Washington agrees on the main issues that uh, that actually do affect us. So they try to keep people distracted with you know, abortion or uh, gay marriage when the fundamental economic issues are left off the table. So the same thing happens within the field of economics. Um, but the, the fundamental uh, principle behind mainstream economics is that uh, as I mentioned from the German historical school, is that uh, natural science can be applied to human economies, that you can have a hypothesis, design a controlled experiment, and, uh, and be able to reproduce that with, with accuracy time and time again. Um, and this, and on the political front, led to uh, progressivism, which Todd talked about last week, uh, which is basically, it would say, okay, well, we're gonna be able to say with precision what people are gonna do, so us scientists are going to be better at managing an economy than letting people do what they want, because we can help them fix where people aren't, aren't getting it right on their own. Uh, the Austrians have rejected this from the beginning. Uh, they say that humans are complex and unpredictable in this way. Uh, experiments are not reproducible with precision. Um, and even the awareness of an experiment could change outcomes. So I think about Stanley Milgram's a fam famous experiment where they put people in a room and had the, um, the experimenter tell them to shock someone in another room, and they had to give larger and larger shocks. It was a test of how, how far people would go under the influence of authority. 
a lot of us know about that test now, so if we're put in the same situation, we can make a different choice. That doesn't really apply to water. I mean, if we, you know, if we, uh, if someone shows that at a certain point, water uh, will, you know, at a boiling point, water will turn into a gas, uh, water doesn't figure that out and then be able to change when it, when it turns into a gas. So we're dealing with a, a de definitely a different landscape than the natural sciences. Um, so instead, they took as a given um, methodological individualism, which is we're going to take people as individuals and not say uh, with exactitude what's going on in their minds and what they're going to do. And that takes a lot of things off the table, but it also puts certain things on the table. And uh, what they ended up doing is <laughs> viewing economics as a deductive process instead of an inductive process. So we take basic axioms that we can consider self-evident, we'll agree upon for the purpose of this uh, field of research, and then see what we can derive from those axioms. So for, for an example of an axiom, if two people trade, then, and there's no force involved, then they both believe that that trade is in their benefit, or else they wouldn't do it. If one person doesn't think it's in their benefit, they're not going to trade, um, even if the other person wants to. So they both, both parties have to believe that the trade is in their benefit. You could say they're wrong, or whatever, but that's an axiom. that They believe at that time that the, the trade is in their interests. So what can you deduce from that? Um, that if you intervene in that trade with force, and you get them to do something that they weren't originally intending to do by agreement, then they are going to be less served by their own interests than if they had freely traded. So that's, you, you can create principles that seem to have applicability and, and predictability at, out of this deductive process. Um, so the, the first interesting, very, very interesting thing that the Austrians did was they refuted socialism from the start. So it, at the turn of the, the turn of the 20th century, um, Socialism among uh, the intellectuals was considered a given. Uh, the the um, Hegel and Marx uh, were able to convince everybody, uh, mostly by asserting it, that uh, capitalism was the past and socialism was the future, and we were going to figure out how to manage all these things. And so it's it's hard to even imagine today, after the fall of the Soviet Union and all the experience that we've seen, how uh, pressing that was. How to, to, to counteract that, uh, how radical that was at the time. But they were able to do it and to explain why. And what they said was that um, without a price mechanism, uh, socialist economies were going to be unable to calculate. Now, prices are a piece of information that reflects supply and demand. And people use prices in order to calculate their little bit of a vast economy. So by taking away property rights, and not allowing people to freely negotiate, they were gonna destroy prices, and then the economy wouldn't be able to function. Uh, I mean, if you don't have prices, you don't know if you're making too many tractors or buying too much grain. Um, and that's what you saw in Soviet economies. You had these warehouses that were full of uh, you know, screws and nails and uh, different manufacturing parts, and then you'd have people starving in the streets because there was no one was baking bread. Uh, so it created tremendous dislocations, and you had these central planners doing their best, and I'm sure they were well-intentioned, but it's actually impossible for a single human being or a group of human beings to sit there and manufacture out of their own head what goes on in, in an economy. So um, uh, essentially the assertion was from von Mises and Hayek, insofar as socialism succeeded, uh, the economy would be destroyed. Uh, and that's what we saw and very quickly after the communists took over in Eastern Europe, um, they, uh, things started to fall apart very, very quickly. And what they did was they implemented a quasi-capitalist reform where they would go to capitalist countries, figure out what prices were, and then operate their economy as if those were the prices. <laughs> of course, I mean, they're, one thing, they're going back to what they claim to repudiate, and that's less efficient. You know, prices are constantly fluid, they're changing based on uh, different inputs, to have someone have to go and collect these prices uh, was, was a very inefficient way to operate. But it did keep them going for a uh, better part of the century, whereas uh, I was looking in those initial years like it was going to be a very uh, quick and fleeting experiment. Um, uh, except today, 
we have what's called the mixed market economy, which is where most of Western civilization op operates upon, which is a fusion of uh, socialism and, and capitalism. And basically, the capitalist part of the economy uh, carries the other part. And uh, it, it provides prices. And um, so and, and it, it could work on a roughly proportional basis, where the extent to which you're introducing, you're introducing force into these free trade relationships is the extent to which the consumer uh, who is the boss in Austrian economics uh, is not being served as well as they, they would want to be uh, left alone. So the U.S. is a case of this, as an example, um, and you can take Sweden as a very extreme example, though they've, the last 20 years they've been rolling that back too. Um, do we have any questions so far? Or? Okay. Um, I'm just going to hit on some fundamental points of the art. So that was sort of the history portion. And there's some fundamental principles that underlie the Austrian school. Uh, all values are subjective. So this is this is very different than most approaches to economics. So to be able to, most approaches to economics want to say, well, you know, uh, th this economy is bad because they don't have sufficient manufacturing. And manufacturing is good. Now that's, that's an ought statement. That's saying, I, we think this is good in an objective sense. The Austrians, stay away from that. They say the only thing that's good in the economy is what serves the ends of consumers. And people are the input, what you want, and that's a subjective thing that, that each of us uh, determines on our own. Um, they say preferences are not ordinal, but cardinal. Um, so that means that uh, our preferences are more like rankings than something that we could quantify on our own. We don't want to say we want a television set. The television set's going to give me 15 utils, which would be like a unit of, of utility, um, whereas uh, you know a new car would give me 30 utils. We sort of meet our most pressing need first, and then we go on to the next one. And that goes into a whole theory of marginal utility, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but what it does, it does uh, refute utilitarianism, uh, which was another way of trying to estimate what people want rather than asking them, and, um, uh, and then man potentially manage an economy. Uh, it also means prices are fluid. People can change. You can change your opinions. You can decide one, one day you want something, the next day you want the next. So to say that the price of oil ought to be this, or the price of clothing, ought, you know, the price of a shirt should be $15, well, we don't really know that. No one knows that. It's just a, a, a discovery process through the market. Um, that's the next point. The market is a price discovery mechanism. So entrepreneurs uh, arrange resources to satisfy demand. Profit is the mark of their success. Uh, so a lot, a lot of people, this is one of those things that uh, you know our, our ape brains get us stuck into, is you see someone who's making a lot of money, and you say, well, they must be... Uh, they must not be negotiating fairly with me. They're, they're gouging. Um, it is possible in an economy, and in fact, the way it's supposed to work, is if someone is serving you better, they profit more. So if you see, um, you know, people talk about the oil companies, for instance. I'm not a huge fan of the oil companies for other reasons, but, um, you know, the oil companies can make record profits and be delivering you gas for cheaper. That works in economics. And it's not something that people necessarily uh, intuitively grasp. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So economic transactions, uh, unhampered economic transactions are a win-win for all parties from the subjective point of view of those parties. Um, I already sort of covered that. So demand is, is hypothetically limited, limitless and supply is limited. So this is a very key point, and we'll get a little bit into uh, later into what the, the modern version of the historical school and the, uh, and the progressives say on this. But just remember, the demand is limitless. I mean, you could, if someone could supply you with infinite something, then whatever you wouldn't use, you'd sell off. So you, of course you, you'll, you'll take it. But uh, we, of course, we're constrained by by, uh, by supply. Um, let's. See. Inflation describes the money supply, not price levels. This is a big thing. If you're listening to uh, CNBC, uh, if you're listening to a politician talk, um, whether they did this purposefully or not, um, the use of the word inflation now popularly, it, it refers to price levels. So let's say when, when, when gas is going up, when the price of milk is going up, that we're having inflation. The Austrians would say that's inaccurate. 
and that um, the word inflation originally, and what it, what to be clear, should mean refer only to the money supply. And the reason you do this is because uh, prices can move on their own, but the money supply does have a, 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 a predictive factor in where prices are going to end up. So if someone doubles the money supply, uh, that's, they've created 100% inflation, then all else being equal, you can expect prices in the economy to go up by 100% over the next period of time. And it happens unequally, and there's other factors that get into play, but all else being equal, those prices will rise. Now, nothing has changed except that more bills are going after the same number of goods. So that's inflation, and that's something that we need to be able to be clear about so we can isolate uh, what part of the economy is <coughs> nominal growth versus real. And uh, an example of that would be um, since the, the credit crunch in 2008, uh, the stock market has doubled from its lows. So we're back up to where we were before the crash in nominal terms, but they've also doubled the money supply since 2008. So in real terms, and I think a lot of us feel this, we're not actually experiencing the prosperity that we did back then because all they've done is basically fudge the numbers by printing a lot of extra dollars. Why, why would, whoever they is, why, why would they have wanted inflation to be about price level rather than money supply? Well, what's the, the propaganda well, benefit of that? Yeah, depends, yeah. Um, to, to view it as a purposeful thing, uh, it benefits people who are in control of the money supply to uh, be able to obscure the fact that they are uh, essentially stealing from us. So when they print new dollars, that deducts value from everyone who holds dollars. So it's a form of transfer of wealth. The tax. But, but just to take the example you cited, um, if you had 100 bucks in 2008, if you have 100 bucks today and you go to Walgreens, so Walgreens and Walmart, you're going to walk out of there with about the same amount of goods as you did then, not half as many goods. I mean, prices... It's not US half as many, but I would, I would say, you know, if you, I pay close attention to price levels, and uh, there's definitely been a change. I think a lot of people will notice, um, at the, whether at the gas pump or the price of milk. Now, I'll agree with you that it's not 100%, and what I, uh, one of the things I sort of glazed by is... Um, that this new money can go into different sectors of the economy first. And that has a lot of implications for sort of screwing up normal economic relations. So it goes into the stock market first, and those people make money and they get to spend that money before the rest of us at lower price levels. So that's what I would argue. Uh, some of what's happening, I wouldn't say that accounts for all of the rally in, in the but, stock but market. Do you, do you not believe official inflation statistics then? I think official inflation statistics are understated, yeah. So if they're reporting 2 to 3% inflation per year, which is what it's been for the last few years, what do you think the real number should be? Um, I think that uh, there, there's a fellow named uh, John Williams who publishes Shadow Stats, uh, who uh, it, that could be one measure of, it, it seems like, based on my own eyeball of it, that he might overstate a little bit, but he basically went and said, well, you know, they've changed the way they calculate inflation over the last 30 years to serve, to, to make it less, so I'm going to go and use the old metric and publish those numbers, and that that uh, shows a much higher rate of inflation. Um, well, if you print out a certain amount of money, does that take away exactly that much value from the total of all previously existing money? Or yes. Exactly? Well, that, yes, but it, but it, the way it manifests in the economy, which is you know, complicated. Uh, Organism, uh, you know, there, if there are productivity gains, uh, then that can uh, sort of make up for that new money. It doesn't really make up because you end up losing the value anyway. But I'd say uh, you, you're running infl they're running inflation at three percent a year, but we're increasing productivity at three percent a year. Then prices will stay flat. But we've lost the benefit of lower prices, and I don't know where this is in my my talk, but uh, for. Um, over 100 years before the advent of the Fed, with some small intervening periods, the trend of prices was down. So you could expect that the longer you waited, the more your dollar could buy. And that's it's like a mind-blowing notion to us today. And it t touches on what Todd said last week, which is that at, at that time, 
people, you, you weren't necessarily, most people weren't nostalgic for the life their grandparents had. They were looking in the future. They just, everything's going to get better and better and better. Well, I mean, it's the same as, as the housing bubble, right? So what happened back then is people saw that happening and there were people in interested sectors that were like, well, I don't want my prices to go down. How am I supposed to make as much money? So they started doing this thing to say, oh, well, deflation is bad. It's terrible. We don't want prices to go down. That's, that's so horrible. Com complete bugging. And the fact that, I mean, if you look at the computer industry as an example, we want prices to go down. I mean, we want compu I mean, computers drop dramatically because of the, all the productivity gains that they're making in that sector. And it benefits all of us. We get cheaper computer. We get bigger that's screens. Computer prices, that's not a, a function of overall inflation levels. That's simply that production is getting the principle applies across the board that if you that if you hold you want to be able to hold money and then be able to purchase more and more productivity gains should give you more value for your dollar over time three percent is definitely uh, a lot lower than inflation a lot <laughs> I higher agree than that. Yeah, so um, you hold six <laughs> so uh, talking about and then just a final sort of princi general principle about Austrian economics is that economic growth is basically achieved by delaying present consumption in order to build capital. Uh, this is something I think New Englanders understand very well. It's sort of putting something away and investing. And um, there's an allegory from, from a book written by uh, Peter and Andrew Schiff called How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes. It's on your <laughs> sheets there. And they talk about uh, these, these guys fishing on an island, three guys fishing on an island. And every day they go out and they catch a fish, and they eat that fish, and they're good for the day. Uh, one guy uh, starts uh, only eating half a fish for a few days, and he puts aside the other half. And then he's got a little stockpile, so uh, he uses a couple days uh, to uh, start tinkering around, and he builds a fish net. Uh, so he's eating those half fish that he put aside, then he builds this fish net, now he can catch three fish in a day. So now he only has to fish every third day, and then he can spend that time figuring out even better and better fish catch, catching mechanisms, and so the economy grows. And he can also sell that, that net to the other people on the island, and you know, it goes on, everyone can, can end up benefiting from that. Uh, so that's how economic growth really happens. It doesn't happen from people in Washington executing the right policies and printing more dollars. And sort of. um, now, I don't know how, how, how you're hearing all this. Um, it might seem straightforward, uh, but uh, th these are really not. These are actually, everything I've said of those principles is controversial to people in politics, academia, um, and, and finance. Uh, these people don't believe this. Uh, in fact, uh, New York Times columnist Paul Krugman called Austrian economics if, uh, comparable to the phlogiston theory of fire, which is basically saying that we're just completely backward and it's is completely unscientific and uh, it's like we're a bunch of alchemists uh, hanging out in our, our garages. Now, uh, it's noteworthy that he also refuses to debate any of the leading Austrians. And so uh, they started a pool um, to try to get him to debate, and they raised $100,000 that would go to a local uh, children's food bank in New York if he would debate Robert Murphy, who's the leading Austrian economist. And it's been over a year, and he still refuses to debate. But I think that's, uh, that's worth noting. Um, so now that we've got this background down, um, there's, uh, this is the juicy part. Um, uh, the, the second great contribution to human knowledge from the Austrian school is Austrian business cycle theory. Um, and this relates back to central banking. Uh, central banking is essentially is uh, it's like Soviet money. So it's as if we, we had this we have interest rates and our money supply are monopolized by a central bank, which is the Federal Reserve in, in the U.S. And it, it's as if we all had to get our. Uh, it's as if we had to all get our. Um, our, our bread from the bread bureau in Washington, and they manage the bread supply for all of us. I think we all agree that that would be a bad idea. Well, that's the money that we use every day, um, and it creates uh, major problems. Uh, the interest rate is uh, is a form of price fix. The, the Fed's interest rate is a form of price fixing. So, um, what you tend to see. Uh, one of the reasons that every country in the world has a central bank is that it's a very efficient mechanism, especially in wartime, rather than having a big debate in the middle of a war about raising taxes to 80% to fund all these, these new munitions. They can simply print the dollars and pay their bills, and it comes out of all our bank accounts without us uh, having most of more wars. That's right. That's right. None the wiser. 
So uh, what you tend to see is there's major inflations during wars, uh, and this goes back in American history, the Revolutionary War, um, the, the expression not worth a continental, that was the paper currency that existed there, was debased to nothing. Um, the there, war, there were wars before central banking, though. Yes. Um, the war Hell? between... The war, the war between the states, or civil war, um, uh, was the first greenback. Uh, that was also a disaster, uh, and they went back to uh, gold and silver after that. Um, world War I, uh, they inflated the money supply, and we had the Roaring Twenties, and then we had the Great Depression. Uh, and World War II, uh, again, they inflated the money supply. In the 70s, a lot of that came home to the roost, and we experienced high inflation. And, um, now, in the, in the 70s, interesting, uh, especially in the wake of Vietnam, they uh, completely took the U.S. dollar off the gold standard. So they're always, up until then, there's still been a tenuous connection um, in, from uh, the, uh, preceding that. They had, in, during the Depression, they had barred uh, individuals from redeeming their dollars for gold. But in the 70s, um, they finally closed the gold window, even for other governments. So we weren't going to honor any of these. Originally, a, a dollar was a receipt to get a certain amount of gold. Now we're not going to honor that. We've got your dollars. Uh, see if you can spend them. That was the idea. And it's been pretty much uh, continuous inflation since. Um, but you'll notice a pattern. So uh, there's a major uh, inflation bubble. Well, they print a lot of money. Then we have this big, prosperous time. And then afterward, we have this huge bust. And that's the Austrian business cycle. That's what it is. It's saying that. Um, the, the root of recessions and depressions is in the boom time. And this is tough for people to deal with. The Keynesians, oh, when, when the, the, the bus time comes, they say, oh, we just need to pump more money. And when they do that, it does temporarily alleviate it. It can alleviate the problem, but then we go into an even, even deeper bust. And that's what we've been dealing with. We've sort of been riding this boom bus train, and meanwhile, eroding our, our capital base for uh, at least 40 years. And, and Realistically, more. It's like drinking to get over your hangover. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, and then even in peacetime, uh, governments are much uh, more likely to keep interest rates too low than to uh, than too high, uh, and this means that we they tend we tend to consume more than we think we have, uh, and the reason they do this is because governments are generally debtors. So it's in their, their benefit to keep a low interest rate. Uh, low interest rate benefits debtors at the expense of creditors. So if you think about you know getting a mortgage back in late 70s, early 80s, maybe your house was $100,000, your mortgage payment was you know, $600. So you've been paying that to the bank for 30 years. Well, what's $600 in terms of mortgage payment today? The bank's been completely uh, uh, screwed <laughs> by that. Uh, by that arrangement, and then so it's to, to your benefit as a debtor. Um, and then a, a good example of, of how this can play out is the housing boom in the last decade. So in the wake of the dot-com bubble in 9-11, uh, they were very public, it was Alan Greenspan and then Ben Bernanke, that we need, to, we need to print, we need to get this economy going again. We print lots of new dollars, it was going into housing. The Austrians came out and said, stop, you know, the, the more that you do this, people are going to, they think they're wealthy, you know, my house is now worth half a million dollars, and my 401k is growing every year, and I'm going to spend, and then it all evaporates once once the bus comes. Um, of course, the Keynesians say, oh, well, we got to pump up again. The Austrians would say, no, the, the bus is the clearing of all these, the liquidation of all these bad debts, and that's the healthy process, and it's going to hurt because of what you just did but you have to go through it now. Um, just a couple more notes on, on the, the ways this can distort an economy. It sends false signals to entrepreneurs uh, to start projects that people really can't afford. So they start building these you know, luxury villas on the mountainside and you know, all, all, all these different things, high-end products, and realistically we, can't, we, we might buy them in the interim because we think we're wealthy, but we're really depleting our own savings and capital stock. Um, sends false signals to consumers. They think they're more wealthy than they are, and you end up spending your savings, and you don't have that cushion that you thought you did. Um, okay, so this, this Austrian business cycle theory uh, also seems fairly simple once, you, once you've heard of it. Uh, it runs directly contrary to modern Keynesian economics. Uh, Keynesian, just to give you a background, is John Maynard Keynes. He's a British economist who believed that government had a, a crucial role in smoothing the ups and downs of an economy. 
um, he thought that recessions were, instead of caused by this, this boom bust, were caused by a drop in demand or a liquidity trap. People stop spending, and then it sort of carries on. Since, since I'm not giving you a raise, then you're not going to be spending as much, and then we're caught in this vicious cycle. He doesn't say why that happens. He attributes it to animal spirits. Uh, there's, there's a function of psychology that people just start, they, everyone decides to have a recession. Well, they don't decide it, but they take signals from other people. Uh, so as long as, what we have to do is flood the economy once again with dollars and get everyone in that, you know, in a better mood, and then the economy is better off. Uh, the monetarists, which is the, the Republicans, the Keynesians, Democrats in this mainstream economic world, um, uh, figures like Milton Friedman, uh, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, those the last two Fed presidents, um, they also embrace Keynes, and they think he's basically right, but they prefer that monetary policy be used instead of fiscal policy. So the Keynesians will tend to say, well, how, how we flood the economy is the government should spend out, out, of the, out of the treasury, we should start new programs, enact new entitlements, or whatever the case may be. Um, the monetarists would rather see the Fed just print the money and what, either buy treasury bills or directly buy mortgages, which they did in the wake of the housing bill. The thing about how destructive that is, you think your house is worth $500,000, so uh, you know it could drop to clearing level where some actual person could afford it. Uh, instead, the Fed comes in and says, okay, yeah, it's worth $500,000, prints new dollars, gives you the money, so you're great. I, I, now I'm, I'm, I'm good, that's what my house is worth all along. Of course, everyone else who holds dollars just took a loss because there's 500,000 new dollars in circulation uh, that's uh, being essentially value being sucked from all of our bank accounts. Is it the monetarist policy, though, a trickle down theory? Did yeah, you, well, did, yeah. Did you repeat the question? Uh, it's true. He's, he's saying, isn't the monetarist policy about trickle down? Um, in, in, in the political side of things, the monetarists tend to be um, a little bit, uh, their rhetoric is more laissez faire. Um, but uh, there's a, so I, to me, there's still a question out whether they're more dangerous because they sort of want to say, yes, we believe in capitalism and uh, we want to uh, lower your taxes and all this stuff, but then they're secretly taxing you through the back door in, in a way that most people don't understand. People don't understand central banking, so they can get away with as much new spending as they want, so they kind of have their cake and eat it too. Uh, and that, was a, that was definitely a feature of, of Reagan's administration and, and subsequent uh, Republican and mon monetarist-led administrations. Um, so getting to the Great Depression, um, it's kind of an important uh, point because it's the ultimate case and people want to understand why we got in there. So I'll just quickly I'm going to give the two views. The Keynesian monetarist view is the Depression was an extended liquidity trap caused by a stingy Federal Reserve. They, they weren't printing, printing enough money, the government had cut back uh, fiscally, and, uh, and we got caught in this cycle. And then recovery was born out of World War II. Suddenly we're spending all this money, we're building munitions, we're financing our allies abroad, and there's lots of activity going on, and that snapped us out of it and we were good. Uh, an interesting side note, Paul Krugman, who I mentioned earlier, has actually called for a simulated war in order to accomplish the same thing. So he said the spending is what's important, not the killing people and the bombing. So why don't we just have a simulated war with Russia? We'll all fire Nerf guns at each other, very expensive Nerf guns. And that, all that money circulating, new manufacturing, that'll help us. So it's, I, mean, I think to, to most people, we talk about common sense community builders. When it comes to common sense, you can apply it there. Well, um, I've, I've heard some people say that war helps the economy. Now, let's say we were to leave all the moral things aside and just look at economics. Is there any value in that argument? No. Could you repeat the question? Uh, he, he was saying uh, that many people say that war helps an economy. Uh, is there any validity putting moral issues aside? And I would say there is not. Um, and I would say that is another one where our, sometimes the people's intuition uh, leads them on uh, to, to a conclusion that's not economic. Um, what about motivation? Would it possibly make people more motivated to work more, which could help the economy in that sense? But, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, big picture, it's not great to build things and then blow them up. At the end of the day, that's not... It's an economic loss. But, but it does raise employment levels because people that were unemployed were then put to work building tanks. Just like in Japan now, 
after the tsunami, they've had to rebuild a lot of buildings. And I would so say that, that, at, that yeah. if you look at Japan's economic growth rate, it, it, it kicked up quite a bit because all sorts of things had to be rebuilt. Are they better off than had their things not been destroyed in the first place? No, but in terms of getting the economy, in terms of increasing employment, yeah. GDP numbers suffer from the broken windows fallacy. Uh, so uh, the broken windows fallacy, did, did we cover that already? No. So the broken windows fallacy is if you have a baker and someone goes up to the bakery and throws a rock through the window, uh, the people that advocate that point of view would say this can be an economic plus because now the glass maker has to go and make a new window. But what they're not seeing is the fact that the baker now has to spend on a new window instead of either spending to buy more ingredients, make more bread, or to expand his business. So they're missing the hidden cost. So yeah, you can see that there is some activity going on as a result of that, but on the whole, you can conclusively say that it's a, it's a net loss. Yeah, but don't you think, though, that, um, that corporations and things are arguing for that simply because they're so large and everything, but like the baker who is, you know, connects his, his um, literally his bread and butter, <laughs> you know? And so uh, I've heard the government argue that the corporations can afford those losses and that the people down that it's going to employ the masses and they're the ones actually spending. So how do you argue against that on that larger scale? Um, just to repeat, so the question is, can could people be lobbying for this because they're in a uh, in a position to take advantage of even though it's an economic loss overall, it could be a benefit to them. And yeah, that's that's certainly a war is a huge boon to a very small special interest. Uh, you know, they can uh, these uh, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about, uh, they lobby for this and you know you could argue that they are uh, partially responsible for uh, trying to promote these uh, this economic misinformation, to try to convince people that this is in their interest when it's really not. It's, it's kind of a manipulation and a corruption. Um, so the Austrian view of the Great Depression is that, as I said, it's caused by a rapidly loosening and tightening monetary policy. Now there was tightening in the Great Depression, so it wasn't just that they, they uh, loosed the monetary policy, uh, and this is very rare, usually central banks will, it's like how loose do you want to be, but they actually did do some tightening and that, that has its own problems. So they were manipulating the, the currency where everyone's doing this transaction, uh, all their transactions, and that created all these dislocations. Um, and then that, it was compounded by what Robert Higgs, who's an Austrian scholar, would call regime uncertainty. So you had um, first Hoover and then Roosevelt in power, and uh, people, they were abrogating contracts and nationalizing industries, and people couldn't plan for the future because they didn't have stable property rights or a stable unit. That's, that's a disaster for an economy. It was sort of, it was almost our, our quasi-Soviet uh, episode. Um, and so recovery, the Austrians would argue, came from uh, when we returned to a more stable money supply and a dramatic reduction in government intervention in the post-war. So all that New Deal stuff had pretty much been exhausted by the end of World War II, and uh, the, the next generation that came in really uh, you know, buckled down and cut spending. And uh, here's why I think the Austrian view is correct. Uh, with the logical, we've covered the broken windows fallacy. There it is. Um, so you can think about it from a, from a deductive logical standpoint. Empirically, uh, you can look that the economy didn't pick up during the war. In fact, during the war was some of the depths of the Great Depression. People were on rations. People didn't complain as much because there was a wave of patriotism. But people were really struggling to get by. Um, uh, and so what you see is that it took actually five years after the war ended to get to a sustainable GDP growth once again. So that, that suggests that it was a lot of the measures that were put in place, the fact that people take a few years and say, okay, well, we're gonna, um, we have an agreement now, we have some base rules to play with, and we'll start investing again. Um, and then, uh, historically, um, <coughs> one interesting point uh, is that there was, uh, how many people here have heard of the, uh, the crash of 1921? <laughs> okay, the world crash before the big crash. Um, so, I hadn't heard of it until I got into all this stuff. Nobody, pretty much nobody hears about it. They don't teach about it because it was a steep crash. It was, it was on the magnitude of what happened in 29. But it, they, the government didn't uh, uh, 
respond to it using the, changing their fiscal policies. Um, they didn't try to intervene uh, to, to the same extent. They didn't change monetary policy, and prices went down to a clearing level, and then everyone got back to work. You know, so they think about the house again. So your house, okay, your house isn't worth half a million dollars. You can sell it for 250. Make the sale. You're not holding out to think that maybe the government's going to come and pay you that half a million. That it's not worth. Everyone just the, the market clears and we get back to work. And it was quick. It was over within uh, less than two years. Uh, and we don't even we don't even talk about it. Whereas um, the uh, the Great Depression was supposed to be the great uh, example of how the, the progressives were going to save us. Uh, they had free reign. Uh, you could say that it was somewhat hemmed in by the Supreme Court. But essentially, they he, Roosevelt got a lot of what he wanted. He was that kind of guy. So uh, and and it didn't really turn out all that well. Uh, so fast forward to today and your lives and how this all applies. Uh, most Austrians would agree with me that the U.S. is currently in a depression, an economic depression. I would say that we're in as grave an economic circumstance as the Great Depression, probably worse. And uh, one of the reasons that we're not all panicking in the streets is because uh, some of this inflation and nominal values have concealed uh, our dropping standard of living. Um, but uh, really we've been eroding our capital base since, uh, since the 70s and, and somewhat before. Um, we, we had huge gains from, from the internet. I mean the fact that you think about how long it took to get anything done in an office before computers and before the internet. And the, the, you know, people would cycle papers around to each other and you know, wait days to get gear back. And now that's all instant. That should be a huge boom to us. And in fact it was. And I think what that did was sort of conceal a lot of the uh, intervention and the inflation that was going on. They, we were making up for it by, by increasing our productivity at such an incredible rate. Um, but eventually that, that sort of mellowed out. Uh, and what we're, now what we're seeing is a lot of that catching up with us. Um, and uh, we ended up, we had saw the dot-com bubble, the housing bubble, um, uh, some figures that were accurate in predicting those things and explaining why Peter Schiff Jim Rogers, Mark Faber, <laughs> Don Paul, so all people who are uh, trained uh, in Austrian economics, um, and they, they saw it coming. Um, the Keynesian side actually, uh, when things started to slow up in the late 90s, called for a housing bubble. They said it would be good. Uh, and, and Krugman's on, on the record. He said, well, you know, to stimulate the economy, we need to um, uh, boost housing prices. And for, you know, for me, and for a lot of Austrians who view the world through this methodological individualist lens and thinking about all the fallout that's happened to individuals in their personal lives as a result of this harebrained scheme, it's just sort of painful. I'm sorry, what was that about Paul Krugman and housing prices? He said that we need to stimulate housing prices in the early 2000s. He's on the record. He actually literally said we need to create a housing bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, the monetarist like, example will be Ben Stein, who you know from uh, Ferris Bueller, uh, Ben Bernanke. Um, these people thought that house prices would go up forever. The Austrians are saying, explaining why this is unsustainable. They thought it was going to keep going. I, mean, I know I'm hammering this point home, but it's, it's worth knowing because you want to go to the people who knew what they were talking about ahead of time. Um, There's a great video on YouTube on Ben Stein, Peter Schiff, right? And it's just like, really? You really thought that? Right. <laughs> Peter Schiff was right. Uh, this is the name of the video. Um, so, uh, so now it brings us to the present day. The money supply has been doubled. Uh, there's been stimulus programs. There have been bailouts. Uh, there's been cash for clunkers where we took uh, the Washington took perfectly usable vehicles and salted the gas tanks in the name of economic stimulus. It destroyed usable vehicles uh, to jumpstart the economy. Uh, we've got trillion dollar deficits. Uh, so we're in a really bad way. I mean, that's the point of it. And, and people don't necessarily always realize it. Uh, and it's being able to get into that, and this is, I hope, with the, the um, payoff of this sitting here listening to me drone on, is um, going and looking into these issues, if you haven't, or looking into them more, and understanding really how bad the situation is right now, and trying to figure out different ways to, uh, to uh, protect yourself. Um, and uh, I'm not selling anything, so <laughs> it's not a sales pitch. Um, let's see. Look, in the wake of the credit crunch, uh, we saw that private savings um, 
actually went up significantly. So right after the credit crunch, people started doing what, what the market should be doing. So people were, were sort of like, okay, well, I don't have this money. I better start saving again. I'm going to spend less. I'm you know, putting those fish aside. Let's, let's get back to a, you know, a workable system. Um, and then the, basically the, the government steamrolled that whole process. They spent so much. Um, they, they're bailing people out, creating moral hazards, and people stopped. You can look at in the statistics. People stopped saving. They're spending again. They're buying new TVs. They're buying new cars. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would I save? It, it, yeah, that's right. Because as we said, as we said, the, the, this whole process um, punishes savers and creditors and rewards debtors. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, people respond. I don't blame them for that. Um, um, the question, one question people have is, how is Washington able to continue this charade for so long? And uh, I think that's a function of uh, our reserve currency. Um, and a particular uh, arrangement uh, with China. Um, uh, if you look at what's going on in Europe and Greece, they're hitting this, the same issues we had. They're hitting them right now, yet we're coasting along. Uh, right now, the world economy is, is built on a dollar-based system. So a lot of people are still demanding our dollars. They think they want our dollars. They think they're desirable. So we, the Fed's able to create a lot of inflation and just send those dollars overseas. So it doesn't affect us. If they were printing them right into our economy, we would see the prices go up immediately. Instead, uh, we're seeing uh, these emerging economies eat the inflation because they think they want to be part of this dollar system. And they're having tremendous inflation. And it's caused revolutions across the Middle East. And you know the, the, Chinese, the Chinese people are rising up. Um, you're suggesting that the Fed policies have an effect on Middle Eastern economies? Yes. How? Because they're, they're, they need, all, oil is transacted in dollars for one. Um, Let's take Egypt. The, 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 the countries that revolted in, most of the countries that revolted in the Middle East didn't have a lot of oil. What they had, they, they trans, in terms of trading with other countries, that's done in dollars. So what they were finding was that their, uh, their costs were going up. Uh, their ability to import food and other resources uh, was lessened by the fact they were holding these dollars and they were losing value. So you can, they, I mean, a lot of uh, the Greek, pro uh, the, um, sorry, the Egyptian protesters were very clear that the reason they took to the streets was they could no longer afford bread. Um, right, but what did the price of bread in Egypt have to do with the United States Fed policy? Because I'm not clear on that. They're, they're, um, the Egyptian currency, as the currencies of, of most of the emerging economies are intimately tied, they try to manage the exchange rate with the dollar because they, they, they want to take in dollars to transact internationally. So they will actually create, like if you take China as an example, they will create inflation at home to keep that exchange rate level. Well, well China may replace the currency, but I don't think Egypt does. No, they, the, the, all the emerging economies engage in this to some extent. In fact, what you're seeing is um, what they call the... Um, so I'm sorry, so Egypt was trying to keep its currency weak or strong against the dollar? Trying to weaken it versus the dollar. That's the currency war. You can see this in South America as well. That these, these not only are they trying to keep the, keep it level, they're saying, oh, well, the, the U.S. is depreciating its currency to boost its exports, which is a whole other story. Um, so we're going we're gonna to depreciate our currency even faster. And they think, this again, this is a, think, they think it's intuitively in their interest, but it really isn't. They think it will help their exports. They think, it, yeah, their, their export lobby is very powerful. But that's a whole nother, we, we, can, we can have that discussion afterward. Um, let's see. Uh, so China is essentially subsidizing. They're taking our IOUs and they're sending us real, real goods. And whether they believe that they're going to get goods from us at the end, from all these IOUs, uh, or they're just, it's just a government policy and they want to eat it and they have their own reasons for, for doing that, uh, they're accumulating treasuries and U.S. dollars. And these are all claims on our productivity and we don't have much left. So, if, and this applies to many emerging economies. So when they decide that they, they're done with the dollar, then all of these dollars come home. And that's when it can be a very, uh, potentially a very rapid devaluation of the dollar. And I like to use an analogy of, of a seesaw. And basically, like, um, you know, we're up here and, and China's down here and they're, hold, they're holding down. They're, they're keeping us up here. And this is our standard of living. This would be the, the analogy here. So all they have to do is basically push. And then it goes like this, because they have a, a, a policy of supporting the dollar. And they can end that at any time. And when they do that, then suddenly their standard of living will skyrocket as quickly as ours declines. Um, 
so that's the potential end game. It's a very scary thing. Uh, in terms of you know what you can do, so some basic recommendations. Uh, look into hard assets. Try to get yourself out of these fiat currencies. Generally, in the West, the fiat currencies are no good. Period. And that same goes for government bonds. Uh, you want to look into hard assets like commodities. Um, they can be shares of companies, but if you're going to choose companies, uh, you might as well choose them in countries where the future looks bright. It's not the whole world that's facing economic collapse, it's the Western economies. So if you have the ability to, to invest in countries where uh, the prospects are brighter, uh, where they're more like we were 100 years ago, why not do that? But even in the US there are um, uh, companies, if you follow Warren Buffett, he just bought a railroad. You know, that's, that's a hard asset. I mean, it's, you know, they're transporting coal, and even if our, our standard of living drops, people are going to want our resources, so he can take advantage of that. Um, and so you want, and then uh, precious metals, um, historically sound money is generally gold and silver, um, and gold, gold bugs have been generally maligned, uh, I think for many of the same reasons why this version of economics is not taught in schools. Uh, is that it's a very threatening thing for people to be able to withdraw their money into gold. It's something that they can't print or manipulate. Uh, and what you saw in the Great Depression was that uh, there was a, a gold confiscation uh, under Roosevelt. Now, he didn't actually end up effectively confiscating uh, gold, but they did ban private ownership of gold for a long time. Uh, and that's... that's just, hmm? Okay, there you go. So it just shows you how big of a threat it is for them uh, when this is... What she's saying is the saying how big of a threat it is to the government when their fiat system is falling apart. The fact that people, right now, you can just go and turn your dollars into gold. And that's something that can't be printed. It can be mined, but the mining is under, you know, it's under 2% new supply a year. And that's the inflation you're going to be dealing with. So um, that's, you know, one thing to consider. But basically, I would say do your own research. Uh, I've got a handout, there's some websites and resources there for you, some books. Uh, understand as much as you can about how markets work and why, and absolutely don't trust the people that cost you half your 401k uh, again, because uh, they're wrong again, um, and they're giving bad information. Uh, just as a disclosure, I, you know, I work with, uh, the, with financial companies. I'm not a financial advisor or registered broker. Um, if I were, I'd be selling you treasury bills and maybe some shares of Facebook. <laughs> so, shares of Facebook. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. My email's on the handout, so we can talk that way too. And thank you for hearing me out. I have another question. Sure. When you hear about the Keynesians and the monetarists, it just, um, from a psychological standpoint, it just seems like they have problems with natural consequences. Like they, they don't. Whatever the, to to avoid the natural consequences at all costs, fear of greed or you know too much spending or government action or printing too much money, and they, they're just always trying to avoid that. And that can't be good for the psychology of people to have a government saying we don't want you to experience any natural consequences or anything. We're going to protect you from any natural consequences. So from my perspective, it seems like the, the, the government is intentionally harming us psychologically by kind of keeping us from experiencing any any natural consequences. Is that too paternalistic for me to be thinking that way? Or? I don't I don't think well, I think they're interested in staying in power and people don't want to face consequences. And that's what Keynesian is that's what these mainstream economics provides. It provides the government a way to rationalize uh, trying to keep the party going as long as possible. Uh, and you know they only have to think till the next election. And I th yeah, I, I absolutely think it has a, an effect on, on the economy. You look at the history of even Wall Street firms, uh, the further back you go, the more they seemed interested in, in building a customer base for a really long time. You know, their reputation was so important. And then something sort of happened in the late 20th century. Uh, the, these, the old guard got kicked out, and then it was all about the next quarter. And, and a lot of the criticisms people, legitimate criticisms to Occupy Wall Street or you know, have, have of Wall Street um, are might be based on the incentives that are being sent from, from, from the Fed to just make what you can and get out. But I think it's those, entirely... Those firms went public, that's why. What's that? The firms went public. Well, yeah. That, that Before was... that, they were, it was a gentleman's house. Right. And they had skin in the game. Right. There was no money that they were going to lose if those firms went bankrupt. But even the decision to go public and thinking about 
um, you know, not putting your, your customers first or thinking that you're in it for the long haul. I think you see this time and time again that uh, the, the interest rate is sort of a proxy for, you know, it's supposed to, the prevailing interest rate is supposed to be the society's time preference, how much we're willing to put aside, how much we're willing to delay instant gratification for the future. And when they drive that down, you very well could send that message to people that you're a sucker for, uh, for playing by the rules, doing the right thing. But it's, you know, to blame on the government, I think, is really irresponsible because, I mean, I'm 44 and my kids are teenagers and you're older than I am and your kids are older than my kids. But I'm sure if we were to compare notes, um, you know, people want to be able to eat whatever they want and then take a pill so they don't get fat. People want to be able to have their kids watch TV all day but still be educated. And, you know, we want these, it's not to say that it's just the government, is it's this thing out there, I think that it's, you know, people have to take personal responsibility, you know, so I, of course, would say stop paying the government. <laughs> That's my big thing. You know. Well, I, I think one answer. The reason that happens is what we were talking about before, where uh, the reason why I'm not putting my money in a savings account, for example, is because the return is only 0.3% or something ridiculously small, right? Realistically small. Right. Oh, yeah, right. So after inflation, it's even negative. So it's, it's not... When we're saying blame the government, it's the the incentives are now backwards, such that I am doing, I am making the correct choice by not doing that. You have to right. train yourself, though, so that you do not think that the end justifies the means. That you have to force yourself to act on principle. So, I mean, I have savings regardless, even though it's you know. A, a no, but, li but literally, history. let's say that this situation was going to be all the time. Then you would be making the wrong choice because you would be losing money, right? And that's that's the way the system is set up right now. Is is they don't want people to do that. And so, uh, what's a great example? I just bought a house. So, what I realized is, uh, and Peter Schick talks about this all the time. He's like, the idea that uh, <laughs> uh, the idea that uh, a house is an investment is completely ludicrous. A house is a place to live, right? That's its purpose. It's not something that you just sink money in and wait for it to go up. But we all got it in, this head, in our heads over 30 years of time that it was an investment and that it would always go up. 30 years is a long time. So everyone that you know that has ever got into real estate, all of the brokers you know that have ever gone into real estate, all the mortgage lenders that have gone into real estate, they all believe that is true. And they have been acting like that is tr true forever. And they will tell everyone that that's true and they're not wrong, it's just all they know because it's been going on for so long. Well, I'll say in, in Michelle's defense, if you save in, in metals, uh, you know, some, sometimes people criticize uh, investing in gold uh, because they say it's a non-productive asset. Warren Buffett says this, a lot of prominent investors say this. That's right, uh, it's not, a, it's not a, really an investment, it's a form of savings. Uh, it's a way to preserve capital uh, in a way that can't be uh, manipulated or undercut. Um, investments are, yeah, you lend someone money and they get give you a return and you've lost use of that money for a time, but then you get the reward of the interest. So uh, you should do both. Um, but uh, you can save in, in gold and silver and sort of opt, opt out of this whole craziness. Right, right. And, and you know, I'm not being an apologist for saying that they're correct. What I'm saying is that there's it's perfectly obvious why they chose to do those it's things. It's okay, you know? I'm very brutal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, Go ahead. You're right in the sense that uh, modern economic theory says that in times of reduced private demand, uh, the government should increase its demand, and, and one way for the government to get people to spend money is to lower the return for saving it. Yeah. Right. So it's, 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 it is a conscious decision. That is one of the goals the Fed had when it, it when it brought interest rates low, and that's what what's happened historically uh, in modern economies when when there have been recessions. Right, and exactly. That's what you know. Milton Friedman said they should have done during the depression. They, they should have. It might not have been enough, but they should have expanded the money supply. Never enough. To, well, sometimes <laughs> it is. I mean, sometimes. I I've never know. heard it. I've never heard a Keynesian ever say it was enough. Well, no. I mean, if you look at look at the 50 years after the Great Depression, we had some minor recessions, but by and large, uh, 
they're they're pretty short and they're even then by monetary the, the policy the and academic economists for even I'm sorry to cut you off even then uh, academic economists were pushing for they say we could you know, really get get things moving again if we uh, uh, they there there it it's a constant constant push for more and more and more and most of the boom that happened post World War II was because of a huge drop in government spending freed up assets for Anybody who hasn't asked a question yet, do you have any thoughts, uh, anything coming to you? But uh, This is from a while ago, so it may not be <coughs> pertinent to ask it now. But as far as increasing the money supply, there's the people that get access to it first, the seniorage basically. They get most of the benefits before the prices have gone up. But um, what role does the velocity of money play in that? Because it's, you know, it's like the, uh, I forget what the formula is. Um, but velocity has something to do with the value of money. Like if, if I print a bunch of money and just store it in my closet, it doesn't mess anything up. Right. But once it's released into the economy, you know, the uh, the Austrians don't devote a lot of time to those types of studies because it's uh, you're getting into you're, you're thinking about what what's the inevitable result, uh, and, and it's it's questionable whether you can say uh, with any kind of precision how it's going to manifest. Sure. Uh, you're sort of you know, if you've ever seen a Japanese pachinko machine, it's like this, it's like a, it's almost like a pinball machine. There's a thousand pinballs, and you release them, and they'll blah, 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 and they go down. And you have no way to say, oh, well, how fast is this particular ball going to go down? I don't know, but we know that it's going to go, it's going to go down. So that's something we can say with certainty, uh, and um, that's why you'll see a lot of Austrian-style investors will invest, do what's called fundamental investing. Where they get where, where they see the trend is going, and even they'll ride out some pretty extreme uh, circumstances. So right now, there's uh, the dollar is rallying in nominal terms. Uh, so people who are invested in the way that I was describing are taking uh, a hit uh, in, in in a short term sense. But uh, you can't really time to get in and out. There's some some people who are very, very skilled at timing the market and made a career that they also blow up once right. in a while. But but the average, like, no. Yeah, it's, it, it's speculation. So for the average person, you just want to be, um, you want to know that the, where everything's going to settle and not try to uh, get into that game of, of uh, timing everything. Can you give us an idea of where things might go in the next, <coughs> next few years with all these problems we have? Yeah, well, um, you're seeing that uh, China has less and less appetite to continue this program. Uh, they're not buying treasuries like they did, and uh, the Federal Reserve is directly buying uh, a majority of new issue treasuries. So uh, it's it's the jig is coming up, but the question is how how quickly it happens. Uh, China seems to. It, it, it's interesting because we're involved with China, which is a very interesting culture in that. Uh, it, you know, to make completely broad sweeping generalizations, it, you know, they, it's, they, it's, there's some calculating um, the Chinese government, uh, you know, they don't always come out and say what they're doing. At least here, like a, a Keynesian will say, yeah, this is what we're doing, you know, I want a housing bubble. Um, so it's a little hard to read what their end game is, but you can you can look in the market and you can see that uh, these emerging market central banks are accumulating precious metals. They're getting, they're getting rid of their dollars and accumulating precious metals. You can see that they're buying fewer and fewer treasuries. And I think that, um, you just to make a sort of a cultural guess, that uh, they, they don't, the Chinese government doesn't seem to be in favor of big moves. They do things kind of gradually in a test and experiment. So um, they, they're, I think they're, they're moving that way, but they're not trying to do anything dramatic. And that, that might... Uh, they might see that as in their interest because if they cause a big rush in the dollar, then they have to acknowledge that they accumulated all these IOUs um, foolishly in front of their own people. They kept their people impoverished, really, to accumulate a bunch of American printed paper. So um, if, they can, if they can quietly go and start buying things up and tr trading that for real assets, which they're absolutely doing, then uh, hopefully they can get rid of a lot of it and then then they could come out and say, well, we're dumping the dollar, and then all the other countries that are less sophisticated uh, will get stuff. I think you see this in Africa where they're buying natural resources. Yeah, absolutely. They're moving into those markets and getting into the basic commodities. 
Oh, there's, yeah, they're spending money like crazy. They're offering to bail out European states, anything to gain favor. They don't, they're not showing a tremendous guard for these uh, regard for these precious U.S. dollars. You know, they're, they're going out there, well, you know, sure, we'll, we'll bail you out, you know, whatever. But meanwhile, the U.S. government is having to negotiate, so Bill Clinton essentially gave the entire port of Long Beach, the Chinese, and so they control the whole, you know, port um, coming in uh, into California, and then they've just purchased uh, radio stations, which weren't supposed to be torn out. So the United States government has lost, I mean, it has, it has the weak hand now, so. Yeah, if you're a patriot, I mean, you know, the, uh, the part of the end game here is there's going to be a huge fire sale on whatever's left here, and we're not going to be in a position to outbid. You, know, you can already see that we, we come from New York and the New York real estate market, you know, there's people from overseas coming and spending all these dollars that have accumulated and it's really unreasonable for native New Yorkers to, to buy real estate. Uh, and that's what's gonna happen. And then you know they'll, anything they anything that people can, that's that's tangible that they can trade these rapidly devaluing dollars for, that's what they'll do. I, I appreciated your presentation because I learned a lot primarily from the examples you gave behind that from the theory. Um, and the one that was most interesting to me was about how our behavior and our values are tied to the economics. And then, right, and then on top of that, you ended it with taking responsibility. And I, I appreciated that as well. But for me, the problem is we validate ourselves through consumption. We validate ourselves by having a car, having a watch, having a person, and we're not part of that. You know, and so to me, the bigger issue, really want to change, I don't care what theory we're running about. If we are continually validating ourselves through things, we're always going to have this problem until we learn how to validate ourselves differently. Hmm. Well, I that's going to have to stop. What's that? That's going to have to stop. What's that? I mean, we can't buy junk. That's it's right. It's going, to it's going to stop. And then we're going to be left. And hopefully, maybe that is the time for the spiritual revolution. And I'm not talking about a puppeteer in the sky pulling strings. But a real, a real connection. Well, I think that's a lot of what Kevin's trying to get out of this. You're speaking my language. Yeah, now. thank you. Because, like, you know, we we have, we have economic meetings. Um, there's meetings for, for libertarian people. But um, you know, I talked to Kevin about uh, his community building enterprise, and that it's more than just getting the theory right. That's why I'm here. There you go. Yeah, is that we're, we're going to have to start to pull together, and I think that process, the incentives are going to change, and that process will happen somewhat naturally. But it'd be nice to be prepared and be good neighbors, and then have it. Peter Schiff has asked about the Bitcoin and Um, do you agree with that analysis? And if so, how big? I haven't heard him. Uh, full disclosure.